Well, even though Kyle continues to perform exorcisms, that is not what his true purpose is as shown in this episode. Hey guys, coming up for Outcast Season 1, Episode 5, The Road Before Us, and I was definitely looking forward to this episode. I absolutely loved Episode 4. I thought there was some really great things brought up, and especially uh, the thing we found out with Anderson. The fact that, like I said, these exorcisms might be performing, might not do anything, and that's kind of what the main subject is here, but we focus a lot less on past possessions and a lot more on Kyle's family life, because we're reminded in this episode that that's what Kyle's true purpose is. He's not in this show to just, you know, solve exorcisms and be the one to do all that. No, that's Anderson's job. His job is to clean up his life, and that's exactly what he wants to do in this episode. You definitely see that, and I absolutely love this episode. For me, this was the best episode of the season. I absolutely love this episode. I thought there's, there was some emotionally great scenes here, and just... A lot of stuff that we've been waiting to see finally goes down this episode, and we'll definitely get into that, but let's just get into it because there's a lot to talk about. The only thing about this episode is that there's nothing going on with Megan and Mark and Donnie. That whole plot kind of takes a back seat in this episode, but it made sense because we focused so heavily on Kyle's family life, then it made sense why that had to take a break. So, you know, even though Megan's a central character, at the end of the day, Kyle's our main character here, so it makes sense why um, we do that. Not really complaining, but... Basically, we start with a flashback, and we see Allison's possessed. She goes to the fridge, and then goes to Amber's room playing with her dolls, and uh, then we see her back, you know, now, and Allison tells her it's time for lights out. She has school in the morning. Amber says that she's no fun. Allison says sometimes it's her job to be no fun, mostly on school nights. She looks outside and sees Kyle's car, gets incredibly worried, because, again, the one thing she doesn't want to do is face Kyle. We just know what Kyle did to her, and especially the fact that she feels that Kyle's the cause of what happened. Uh, we'll get into that in a little a bit, but we actually get a lot more into Allison's pain here, which I really did like seeing, but Anderson says it's the stupidest idea ever, and they actually did in fact go back to Allison, which we didn't really know where they were going. All we knew is that Anderson was dri not driving on the road, and he actually did turn around, and Basically, he asks if Allison ever do has done anything to make him certain she's still possessed, and Kyle asks how many years was Mildred coming to his service before he knew the truth, and Anderson says that Mildred was a special case, and Kyle says they know people can walk and talk and act normal and still have one of those things inside of them. You know, you might not even be able to tell. They could just be the most normal of individuals, and they'll still have it inside of them, and he tells Anderson that his daughter's in that house, and he has to know for sure, and as he's about to get out, Anderson stops him and reminds him that if he puts one foot in that property, Property, Allison will definitely throw him in jail, and there's really nothing you can do about that. You know, no matter what happens, she'll call the authorities. That's just how it works. You know, she has a restraining order, and she can use that against him. And there, even though he wants to confront his wife, he's never going to be able to because she does have that restraining order. And I really did feel bad for Kyle because of that. Because as much as you do want him to reunite, you know, with Allison and with Amber, she has a restraining order, and really he's not going to be able to have that life. You see, and I thought that definitely is very interesting and a really good way to start the episode and I think also really just sets how emotionally draining this episode is because this really is a very emotional episode not that every episode hasn't been but this episode by far is the most emotionally powerful one we've had so far and Aaron says he doesn't know what happened with Mildred. Maybe he didn't stick with it long enough, but every other exorcism worked just like it. You know, he's convinced that every other exorcism worked just like it did with Joshua, and he can prove it. And that's really a big part of this, is that he's trying to prove to Kyle that my exorcisms work. You know, I've done it for years. I know what I'm doing. Kyle's still, you can tell, unconvinced, though. He's not really sure. And Allison's brushing her teeth, looking in the mirror. And I love it throughout this entire episode. We get close-up of her eyes, because as we know, when we get the close-up of the eye, usually it's when someone's possessed, and we don't know if Allison's possessed or not, so it's just as interesting watching her, and it kind of makes us a bit terrified seeing Allison with her daughter, because if she is possessed, we know exactly what she's going to do. She's going to do what Joshua did to his mother, she's going to do what Blake did to Terry, and... She's going to do what Mildred is kind of doing, we can tell, to her daughter, we can definitely tell. So I thought that definitely was interesting. So Megan gets a call from Kyle who says he needs to see Allison, he needs to he needs to set it up, and she says that he's lost his mind, he says he needs to talk to her in person because he needs to know if they're alright, and she says, of course, they're not after what happened, she says he's fucked up, and him trying to see her now is going to fuck her up even more. And honestly, I do understand what Megan's trying to say, that really, you know, Allison is very emotionally tortured over what happened, and seeing him is just going to make things worse, and really, in the way that Megan, you know, is so tortured by Donnie, Allison is tortured by 
Kyle, and I think we're understanding more why Megan sympathizes so well with Allison and why she kind of takes Allison's side, because even though she knows that Kyle, I don't think she thinks would do something like this, she understands why she feels this way, and Megan's been through this thing before, which I think is probably the main reason why we've introduced this whole Donnie subplot. I think that's definitely the main reason why. But she says she'll go check on her, make sure she knows she's got some support, and he thanks her, says to make sure she seems like her, and... Megan asks what that means, and remember, Megan doesn't believe any of this paranormal stuff, and he says he has to go, and he'll talk to her later, and Giles then goes to see Ogden at the firehouse, we know that he's the one he's suspicious of, I forgot his name for some reason, Ogden, of course, was his name, and sees that he's not wearing the watch, and Ogden says that he has to get the glass fixed, and you can tell throughout this whole episode, Giles is very subtly studying him, he's trying to study him, he's trying to figure out what he's doing, because he knows that somehow he's connected to what's going on, and Giles says he heard about the fire out at Lola's place and asks if he has any idea what started it, and Ogden says they never came back with anything conclusive, no damage done, and who gives a shit, and Giles says if it was deliberate, he does, and he needs a why and a who, and Ogden says it was just teenage punks, they see something, they would just want to break it, burn it, or fuck it, and really, I mean, he's not wrong there, but we know there's definitely more going on then, and Giles says that he thinks he's right, Ogden says he came over there to ask him about some brush fire, and Giles says that it was just an excuse, he missed his breakfast and takes it and says he'll see him later, and Again, the way that scene is done, you can tell that Giles obviously wants to get questions out of him, but it's just not the right time right now, you know, he needs to figure out what's going on, and really figure out if Ogden is as connected as he thinks, which I do like seeing, I think it's really interesting the way that that's going, and I know a lot of people aren't loving this whole investigation storyline, I will admit it's my least favorite part of the show, but... The actors are really great, they were doing a great job, and you can really tell this is starting to go somewhere, and it definitely is connecting to what's going on. I just don't really know what's fully going on there, and that's still the one thing that I think by the end of this episode we still are very uncertain about. So Kyle and Anderson then drive to see someone, and we get several scenes like this in the episode, but it leads us to the big reveal, which I'll get into a little bit later, but Kyle asks if he called them and told them that they're coming. Aaron says he didn't because there's no way he could, and Kyle asks if he thinks this is going to sound better face-to-face, -face, and Aaron says he has no idea what they're going to find there. The point is for him to see that his exorcisms work. You know, he doesn't really know what he's going to find, but he's hoping that he can, and I like that you kind of see he's a little bit uncertain here. Even though Anderson is trying to prove to him that his exorcism work, you kind of get the sense that he's just saying that to kind of comfort himself, that he doesn't want to believe that all this work he's done is wrong and that it hasn't actually worked, but you kind of get the sense that maybe it has, because Arison goes to see this man named Roy, who asks him what he's doing there. He introduces him to Kyle and says that they were in the neighborhood and they just want to check with, in them with them and make sure that Sherry's still doing all right. And he says it's fine. Kyle has similar experience. And asks him how she is. She must have started college. And Roy says he wishes he could tell him that for sure. She hasn't been home in some time. And he says that she's living in Charleston now. And Anderson says that they all have to leave the nest eventually if he's lucky. Roy says it's not like that. She's on the streets and he hasn't seen or heard from her in months. And Kyle Asks, and uh, Anderson asks what happened. Roy says the father's job is to protect his family, and when he fails at that, and Kyle asks if Sherry, um, unfortunately ran off, ever showed signs that the demon might still be inside of her, and Roy says not after. You know, he feels that he got it out of her, and Anderson says he did his thing, and Kyle asks if he's sure it worked, and Aaron says they drove the demon out of her, and Kyle says she's not even here. How does he know that? And again, Kyle's just, he's not on, he's not convinced. He's not convinced here, and Anderson says that he's just speculating, and Kyle walks away, sits in the car. Anderson comes in and asks if he's happy. He says that man lost his daughter to the streets, and how would he feel if it was Amber they were talking about? And Kyle says he'd want to know the truth. That's how he'd feel, and he wants to know if his daughter was still possessed or not, and says the whole point of this is for him to show him that his exorcisms have worked, and he's still waiting to see that, because he doesn't believe that they do. Everything he's shown him, he's just really skeptical about it. just doesn't seem to appear that it works. And Anderson says to apologize for being such an inconsiderate prick out there and says he's doing this for his benefit and not his own. Kyle says he's sorry and just a really interesting scene the way that went down. Allison's then getting groceries from her car when Megan comes up to, to her and Allison asks what she's doing there. Megan says that she was remotely in the neighborhood so she thought she'd stop by and Allison asks if that was Kyle out there last night in the car. Megan says she doesn't know what she's talking about and Allison says that he just sat there in the dark and realizes that she's talking about Kyle and... She says she had no idea about that, and if it's true, she'll give him hell for it, and she says she came all this way because she's worried about her and misses her, and Allison asks her if she wants to come inside. She goes to Amber's room to remove wallpaper, and we get this really nice talk between these two that I really did enjoy. 
But even though, like I said, it's a nice conversation here, you're kind of also worried. Because, again, they make you think that there's a possibility that Allison could be possessed. And, of course, Megan doesn't understand most of that, uh, most likely, but you do kind of get the sense that that could be happening with Megan. Because the way that Allison talks here, uh, Megan says that she's had a lot of change in her life and maybe some things should stay the same. Allison says that nothing has. She didn't have to lock the doors every night or panic every time she heard a dog bark or a car in the street. And says if Amber acted up, Kyle, you know, could handle it because he was always the calm one. And now he's not there, you know. He's not there to calm her down. And that's kind of like what Kyle's doing with the exorcism. He's kind of the one to be the mediator. He's the one to break up fights. You know, he instigated a couple of fights, but he most times is the one to be the mediator. And Megan asked if it would help if her and Kyle would talk and she could be there as well, Mark, and as well as Mark, just for Amber's sake. And Allison says no, sits down, says she feels like everything that held her down is gone and she's just flowing away and scares her so much and there are memories and days that she just can't access and she doesn't know if, he, if she lost something or if something is just getting in the way blocking the truth. Megan hugs her. She then goes home the night, opens up the cabinet. She looks at pills and then closes it. And I realized very quickly that she wasn't home. I thought she was home, but she's actually still at Allison's house. And she's basically trying to figure out what made Allison this way. Why is Allison so, you know, paranoid? Why is she so worried about everything? Why is she just so bitter about what's going on? And Arison then takes Kyle to a pet shop. Kyle says he doesn't think they're open. Arison says they're out to lunch, and Kyle says it doesn't even look like they're still in business. And the owner of the store, Brian, comes out. Arison asks how's life. Brian asks what he's doing there and introduces him to Kyle and says they're just doing some reach and checking up on friends. And... Brian lets them in. Aaronson says he closed up shop. Brian says too much work dealing with animals all day. He's talking about the ones that walk through the door. Little Precious can only eat grain, free food. He sits down, and right away, the second we heard this guy's humor, I'm like, why is that like Blake when he was possessed? I'm like, oh shit, this guy most likely is possessed. Because he's very bitter about this entire thing, and Aaronson realizes that he's living there and says his wife Carly got the house, and they're not together anymore. And Aaronson asks what happened. This shop was his life, and... Brian's is feeding kibble and cleaning up Gerbil shit, uh, you know, um, Gerbil shit is his life, and Kyle goes up, strangles him, suspecting that he's possessed, and Brian pulls out a shotgun and tells him that he doesn't like to be touched, and Anderson says they're not there to hurt him, they want to help him so they can get the thing out of him, because he knows he's possessed now, and he's got to listen to him, and they run out and go outside, Anderson says the devil's a trickster, making them believe he's up and gone, but he's hiding in there, Kyle says wherever this happened, they've got to deal with it, and if the rest are like this, then they got to do something, and he's, you know, really wants to help him at this point, but then he gets a call from Megan, who says that she saw Allison, she's on to him, and asks if he was at her house last night, and... Kyle asks if she agreed to see him. She says she's not going with him, stalking her, and she's not going to ask her again. She's way too fragile, and Kyle asks what she means, and she says it might be the meds she's on, but something's not right. And again, this is just furthering Kyle's proof that his wife could still be possessed. That's the whole reason he wants to do this. It's because he wants to make sure that she's not possessed and that his daughter is in safe hands because he really doesn't believe she is. And she says he needs to stay away from her. And again, you can get the sense that he's about to go back. You know, he was going to help Anderson, but then Megan pulled him back in, and then we get the scene. He goes to Anderson, says to take him to Allison's, and Anderson says they need to figure this out. He tells him to figure it out, and he's not wasting any more time, and he's not going to help him now. You know, his family is his biggest concern, and again, Kyle's not there to perform exorcisms. He's there to clean up his life and save his family, and what did Anderson say to him in the last episode? He said the first thing you can do is clean up your shit, and that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to clean up his life and... Harrison gives him the key, says he can take the car, but he needs to drop him somewhere first because there's something he's got to do for an old for an old of peace of mind. Sydney then goes into a house and he's looking through many doors and cabinets. He lies down on a bed and we don't know where he is. I thought he was in Kyle's house, but I don't know. Actually, they didn't really say where he was. I think he was in Kyle's house. I don't really know. But really well done scene. Again, just really, they do really good stuff with Sydney, just making him really cheap, really creepy. Mark then tells Giles about the DNA sample match from the burn trailer in the woods. And we realize it belongs to a woman, Lisa Payton, who was reported missing six months ago. And Mark says that they got the DNA of a missing woman who was at the scene of what looks like a slaughterhouse that just got burned to the ground, trying to make their job a lot harder. And how much does he want to bet they don't find her 50 yards from where they found that camper? And Giles says if he wants to make a big homicide case, he needs to find out if she's really gone, and maybe she just doesn't want her boyfriend to know where she is, to find a parent or a sibling, someone she's not as eager to run away from, and Mark says that he will, because obviously, this might not be a homicide case, it might actually be that she just 
you know, literally just ran away from her boyfriend and she could be hiding, you know, with a parent or something. So I thought that definitely is very interesting. I like that we, like I said, are really jump starting on this case and it's actually kind of, kind of going somewhere. Kind of. Not a lot, but we definitely are getting more going on. Kyle then drives up to Allison's house. He rings the doorbell and finally we get the long awaited confrontation between these two. Basically, he. Immediately when she sees him, she wants nothing to do with him. He says he's not there to hurt her. He just wants to talk. He won't commit or anything. And if she doesn't want him to, she opens the door, asks what he wants, and he asks if she can come all the way outside. He says he's already there, and he can't just talk through a crack, through a creak in the door. And she says last night, parked up front, that was him. And he says he wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. And she asks what he wants, because obviously there's a reason why he's there. And immediately Amber runs to up to him, asks when he's coming home. He says that that's not up to him right now. And again, remember, she says that Kyle was the calm one and was also the one to calm down their daughter. So really, Kyle is what Amber needs right now. But as we know, because of the history that Allison and Kyle have been through, Kyle cannot be around Amber right now, which really sucks. I think that's really the thing that Amber needs is someone like Kyle. And she asked if Allison told him to leave. Allison tells her to go inside, and Amber says she wants to be with Kyle. She wants to show him her new bike and tells him to watch her ride it, and Allison says to not make her tell her again. Amber says that she's a mean bitch, and Kyle says to apologize to her, and Amber says she wants to live with him, and Kyle says she's just saying that because she's mad at her, and that's not fair. Says she's done nothing wrong, and Allison picks her up, tells her to go inside, begs for Kyle, and again, she thinks that Kyle really, and again, just the fact that we know that Allison could be possessed is kind of scary here, because again, the way she's begging for Kyle, I was like, holy shit, she might actually be possessed. The way the show did that, I thought was very well done. Allison then asks if this is what she wa he wanted to turn their daughter against her, and Kyle asks what she means, she says to stay the hell away from them, slams the door in his face, and he tells her to wait, and unfortunately it's too late. She's locked him out of the house, and he walks away, but then we get this incredible flashback where we see she's in a hospital, most likely after being possessed, like half of her face is like bruises all over it. I mean, if you look at pictures of abused women, most of them look like how Allison does, and she has no recollection of what happened, and this I thought was just so interesting, because obviously, we know that Kyle was the one that took the blame for what happened. All this time, he thought that he was the one that did it, but then we realized it was Allison that was possessed, and... Then basically the nursing cop is sure she's okay, says her husband's in custody, and he's the one responsible for all this at the station. He made everything and says she does not believe that, and she says to let her go. The nurse says she cannot get out of bed, begs to be let go, and we basically realize in the scene, Allison has no recollection of what happened. She does not know what happened that night. She does not know the details. She does not even know that she was possessed. She doesn't remember any of that, and... That makes perfect sense why Kyle doesn't want to visit her because he wants, you know, not that he wants her to suffer, but he feels that he's already lied to her and he feels that the best thing to do is for her to live her life without him. And I think it kind of makes sense why he wants that. So back in the present, Aronson asks what happened, and Kyle says he couldn't get close enough. Aronson asks if she reacting the way they do around him, and he says it's hard to tell, things get complicated, and Aronson says at least he didn't get arrested. Kyle says he thinks he needs to get home now, and Aronson says first there's a job they need to do. He made some stops in town and worked with some of the groups. They have sheltered the homeless and runaways, and the director of admission there thinks he's seen Sherry, and he wants to bring her home and hope it's some kind of a win, and Kyle says good luck, but he doesn't need him for that, and he feels again that he's not really of use him here. He wants Aronson to do this on his own. Aronson says that he thinks he's under he's underestimating the healing part of a selfless act, and Kyle says we'll take more of a selfless act for his situation, and Aronson says they have to start somewhere. He made him face this first with Mildred, Brian, and now Sherry, and she's still out there because of him, and really, I mean, Kyle's just as involved in this, because Kyle's the one that made Aronson realize this, and if not been for Kyle, Aronson really would not be realizing all this right now, so Kyle needs to kind of go with him here, and I understand that, definitely. So Giles then goes to see Ogden, sees him chopping down a tree, asks how old he is. Ogden says he'd know better to sneak up on a man with a chainsaw. Giles asks if he's going to shut that down. Ogden says he'd like to get it done before dark, says Blight's brought it down. He'd been me meaning to, br to bring it down for a while. Giles says they go a long way back and done some crazy shit, and Ogden says that he's not asking in an official capacity, and really, you know, he's not asking that way, you know, he's asking as a friend, and Giles says they're friends, he might go so far as to say best friends, and he liked to think that if he had a problem, he'd go back to him, and he wouldn't judge him, and that it cuts both ways. Ogden asks what his problem, and Giles says it's not his problem, and again, you, he seems like he's about to question him, but right before he's about to question him, he gets a call from Mark who says Lisa popped up, he talked to her sister in Wheeling, and it turns out that she was hauled up and didn't want her boyfriend to know, 
and he was right to hold back on the dogs. And Ogden asked if it was good news. He says it was just a case he's working on. And Ogden asked what his problem is, and Giles says he's going to let him get back to it. Wouldn't want that blight to spread his whole grow. And you get the sense that even though he's going to tell him, he might not actually be the one behind this. You know, he could just be paranoid. It might not be that Ogden had anything to do with this, which I think is definitely interesting. But again, that's really all we get with the case. We don't really get anywhere else. But then we get this fantastic scene here where we really start to figure out more of what's going on with the demons. So like I said, ever since Sydney's been introduced, I've talked about how I think he's the man behind all these exorcisms. You know, he's the reason this is all happening. He's the one that set up everything, and that's why all of these exorcisms, you know, that's why they're connected to Kyle and everything, and that's what's going on there. And we get, we finally get a sense of what's going on. We see Sydney goes to see Mildred, but he's not there to talk to Mildred. He's there to talk to the demon inside Mildred, and she realizes who he is. She asks what he, she calls him. He says the name is not important. He says he doesn't meet many of them these days and says humans are so desperate to express their individuality and separate them from themselves from each other and it's so short-sighted and she asks if he really wants to make that speech wearing the outfit and he takes off his hat and there's some great dry humor here that I really enjoyed and again it's that great dark humor that Blake had and that Brian had as well. I mean, it's it's really interesting. And she says some of them before she arrived, most of them since, and she asks if he's found things to engage him and says he has a job. And she says she supposed he's there about Kyle. And Sydney says that he came to see her, says that she's not, she says she's not on his own, but he knows. And Sydney says what he knows wouldn't fill one of these. And she asks what if he comes back and keeps trying. He says he'll take care of him. And Kyle says, and Kyle, their responsibility, not hers. And says if Anderson ever gives her any trouble to let him know, but he doubt he will, and she tries to suck his soul out of him, and he pushes her off, says she knows that won't work with him, and she says that he can't blame a girl for trying, says she won't survive till the merge, and what's the merge? I mean, this is the first time we hear about this, all of a sudden, we're hearing about the merge, and we don't know what that means. What I'm assuming is it's when the demon takes full hold of the human, and that's now who the, they are, but he says that she took a chance, just like all of them, and sometimes she'll draw a short straw, and, and um, basically... We now know that there's this thing called the merge, and we know more what's going on. We know that obviously Sydney's there to track down Kyle, and we don't really know what he's gonna do, but I think that's definitely very interesting. Arison then goes to find Sherry. Kyle says he's not even sure if she's going to show because he doesn't even know if they're going to find her. And Anderson says patience is a virtue. Kyle says he's not going to stand around there all night. God help those who help themselves. And they continue to walk. And as they are looking, they find her in a train station. Anderson asks if that's her. And she sees him. He says he wants to take her home back to her father. Tells Kyle to give him a hand. But once Kyle touches her, it burns her, which makes him realize that she is still possessed. And Anderson starts an exorcism. She tells them to stay away. Kyle says they're not trying trying to hurt her, and she says that he's the key, they need, and this might be what Sydney was talking about, she says that he's the key, they need his life, and he asks who they are, she says the nameless, the numberless, they see him through the veil, they come to me, leads them there, and Kyle grabs her, breathes his soul into her, and it's just really interesting, Anderson grabs her, asks what's so special about Kyle, who tells her it's okay, Anderson says he needs to hit her, which he doesn't want to do, they both begin to levitate, and now we're getting the sense that, which I think we thought of before, but all these demons seem to be here because of Kyle, and Kyle might be the one to stop all these exorcisms, you know, if he can, in fact, um bring them there, I think he can definitely bring them back as well, which I think we definitely see that he might end up doing here. But we see she's trying to breathe her soul into him. He begins to float, falls to the ground. Anderson goes to him, and it seems they successfully gotten the demon out of Sherry. It seems like it's gone. And Allison's then at home, sees a trail of blood. But luckily, it's just Amber painting the wall. Allison grabs her, asks what's wrong with her. She's Amber, Amber, terrified, falls to the ground, runs away, and locks herself back in that closet as Allison says she, do, she does, which is per usual for them, but she tries to get her to come out, she sits by the wall, and it's a really devastating scene, just knowing the fact that, you know, we don't, still, we still don't know if Allison is possessed, I think it's just overall really interesting, but you really do feel bad for her, definitely, in the way that, what she has to deal with, and the fact that this is her life, you get the sense this really is her life daily, ever since Kyle was gone, this is what their life has been. And, you know, her daughter resents her, wants nothing to do with her, and I kind of think that Amber might have recollection of what happened that day, and Allison clearly doesn't. I think we definitely do see that here. So Anderson and Kyle are then in the hospital. Anderson says that a prayer to bring Sherry back to them, and... 
Kyle, for the first time, actually really questions what he's doing, asks if he really thinks that's going to make any difference, and he says he does. Kyle says a cherry is a vegetable because of them, and Aerosyn says her soul is free because of them, and Kyle asks if he's calling that a win. Aerosyn says that she's in God's hands now, same as Sarah, and though his soul weeps within, they will have eternity with him, that is a win, and Kyle says he doesn't know where Sherry is right now, but God sure shit didn't put her there, and he knows for a fact that it's not God's doing, and Aerosyn asks if God uh, didn't who did it was, you know, if God didn't, who did it really? Was it him, the outcast, or whatever the hell was his magic touch? And it's very much like Megan, that he doesn't really believe in this whole supernatural stuff. He believes in the Bible, and, you know, he he believes in religion. That's what he does. And I love that we're seeing in the show that everyone really believes in something. You know, Kyle believes in the supernatural. Anderson believes in religion. Megan, I think, believes in, like, morals and things like that, and, you know, just the demons of your past. Mark seems to believe in skepticism. I think everyone really does believe in something we definitely see, and Kyle tells them to wake up all the souls he's saving were gods of infinite wisdom. It's bullshit he needs to look at them. They're all praying a miracle that they both know is never gonna come back because no one's listening and says if his god is out there, he's laughing right at him, and really, he's trying to say that, look, these prayers you've said, they might not do anything, and I, I just think that's overall really really compelling. The fact that all of these exorcisms that Anderson has done, they haven't done shit, really. We've seen that. They haven't really done anything. It's just made things worse. Look at Sarah. Look at Sherry. They are now in these comas, and it's really just made things worse, and especially knowing that Sydney's the one behind all this, which I think pretty much confirms that he is, we know there's definitely something going on. Definitely the merge is going to happen, and that just makes this a whole lot more interesting as to what's actually going on there. Is this actually, did they actually get the demons out? Is Sydney uh, kind of messing with them? I mean, that I think is definitely very interesting. But then we get to the final scene in this episode. Kyle then goes back to his house and finds Allison waiting on his front porch, and this is the one thing that he wasn't expecting to see. He gets to finally talk to her, but in this sense, she actually wants to talk to him, and he asks where's Amber, she says to the neighbor, she's fine and happier without her, and he says it's his fault, he didn't mean to make her upset, he shouldn't have come by the house, and Allison asks why he did, he says he worried about her, he feels he needs to protect her, but he can't but he can't. He's not allowed, and she asks from what. He says it's hard to explain, it's just a feeling, and she says all the time they've been apart, the one thing he hasn't told her is that he's sorry, and she says he apologized for everything, even when he doesn't have any reason to, and she always hated that, and this also, I think, just further, you know, shows the idea that Kyle is not the man he once was. Kyle, we see, used to be this really kind-hearted, good soul, and for these two years that he's locked himself in his house, he's just really grown very bitter and very dark and very cold, but he still really cares for his family, and... You can tell he's trying to clean his life, and he does, and he starts doing that, I think, by apologizing. And she says she knows if he ever did the things they say he did, that he'd at least try to explain. He says there's not an explanation for what happened. She says he, if he could just erase 10 minutes from their lives, it would all be perfect. And she says she has to know if he's the same person he always was, the man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. She goes to kiss him, and he realizes that his touch doesn't burn her. So finally, we now know she's, in fact, not possessed. Now, do I think she's going to get possessed at some point? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a possession show. She's going to get possessed. She's his wife. That's gonna happen. They always do that. And he says she's safe. She asks from what. He asks what happened the night, and he says that she knows, and she says she needs him to tell her. She, she says she's scared, and she says she's outside of herself, like she's watching herself, but she can't control anything, and she can't feel that way anymore. She says she needs him to tell her what happened. Tell her right now, and she says to look at her, and tell him to not to do this. She needs him to tell her, and he doesn't say anything because he just can't tell her, and I took this as, this now is not the time. Now is not the time to tell her. Her life is just way too complicated. There's too much stuff going on. It's too much for her to handle. She walks away. That's where the episode ends. Unfortunately, still very unsatisfied. Even though we know more what's going on, she is still the one kept in the dark. She has no idea what's going on. Seems he's going to continue to keep her in the dark. He's going to tell her at some point. It's just now is not the right time as this episode comes to a close. So overall, guys, there really is a lot to talk about in this episode. I mean, really, a lot went down here, especially the fact that now we know what's going on with Allison, and the fact that she has no idea what's going on what's gone on with her. She's been kept in the dark for years, and that's really what's affected her. You know, for all these years, she's thought that Kyle was this ferocious monster, and that he's the one that did this to her, when she can clearly tell he's not capable of doing so, and she knows there's more going on. And that's the thing I love of this, that's not that Allison is a complete idiot, and that she doesn't know what's going on. She can tell, clearly tell by evidence that there's definitely more going on. The way he 
cares for her, the way that he's, you know, he's still with her, the way that he doesn't seem abusive at all, that's just not who he is, and she doesn't remember anything what happened, and I think it definitely is going to be interesting, I think eventually he's going to tell her, it's just now is not the time, like I said, and it really obviously sucks because she really wants answers, it's just now is not the time to get said answer, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that's all going to go. Um, what is the merge? This is the first time we hear about the merge. What's going on there? It seems that Kyle is the one that can help them in some way. Kyle's somehow connected to all this. We don't really know how he's connected to this, but clearly there's more going on there, and that's something I am very interested in seeing is how Kyle's connected to all this, what his connection is, what's that's going to do for the rest of, you know, for everyone else, what's that really going to do, why are these demons coming? That's something that's very interesting. As far as Anderson's prayers, are they really doing anything? I mean, Kyle's convinced that they do nothing, and that, you know, all this time, Anderson has been spewing bullshit, and I don't think he's far off. I think, honestly, he does make sense here, the fact that Anderson it hasn't really done much of anything, it hasn't really helped anyone, and even though they might have gotten the demons out, they have gotten in much worse circumstances. I mean, we know that Joshua is better, but that's really the only one we've seen that seems somewhat conclusive. You know, that's the one that I think is is pretty much over. Unless, like I said, I think Sydney's messing with them. I think Sydney is making them crazy and making them think that this isn't working. Because that's kind of what I got from this. That Sydney's the reason why this is all happening. Think about it, this stuff didn't start to go a wire until Sydney really showed up, and Sydney didn't show up till the second episode. So I'm thinking that's really what's going on. But we'll have to see more of what's going on with that. Mildred, who is the demon in Mildred? What's going on there? Um, obviously, we can tell the host is dying and. Mildred as well is slowly dying, but we know the demon inside, there's definitely more going on there, I think that's overall really interesting, and then Ogden, is Ogden connected to the trailer, I mean, I think Giles is starting to think that he might be wrong, that maybe he's not connected to this, that maybe there's more going on, how is that girl, Lisa, connected to this, I think that's overall really interesting, and also, is Anderson gonna save Brian, that's like the last person he needs to save, is Brian and Mildred, and then I think he'll feel somewhat satisfied, but I think the more this goes on, the less satisfied he's feeling. He's really getting the sense that he's dedicated his whole life to religion, and hasn't helped him one bit, and I think we're definitely seeing that here. Really do feel bad for, you know, Reverend Anderson, because obviously what he's been through and everything, but like I said, this episode was solely focused mainly on Kyle and his family, and just seeing the mission he's there to do, the way he wants to save them. I hope things end up going well for them. I hope that he is eventually able to save them. I don't really know if he's gonna, going to if he's going to let uh, Allison in on what's going on, if Megan's going to find out what's going on too, because Megan as well has no idea what's going on. And I think really Anderson's been the only one he's really shared this with because no one will really understand or comprehend what he did because everyone thinks that he's this murderer. And it makes sense why, not murderer, but he savagely beat his wife. Everyone seems to think that, and that's why... Mark doesn't want, didn't want anything to do with them, that's why Megan was so scared, and that's why he went hiding for two years, because he doesn't want to admit what's going on, because he just doesn't want her to be the one, she just doesn't want to, you know, he wants to continue to take the blame, he feels he needs to, he's kind of punishing himself, and I think we're definitely seeing that here. Overall, guys, we are now halfway through the season. Things are getting more and more interesting every episode for me. This, by far, is the best episode of the season. Absolutely love this episode. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. If your thoughts on it, we'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for a movie review, and I'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.